response or the relationship between caller and respondent. Yeah, yeah. So that would be a, a kind of an example of it. Yep. Good. Good, good. Yeah, and yeah, definitely a great question that connects so much with what we've been talking about in our course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So one can immediately see how this would uh, be significant for Blacks given uh, America's history of racism. And so its influence on and place in work songs, blues, jazz, and gospel is unmistakable. Uh, here one can see it one more uh, time. So from the video, one is able to see the sense of togetherness that is promoted. And yet, even, uh, uh, and yet it may even allow for the sharing of energy such that the work becomes easier for each member, All right, It seems like each member in the song is drawing from the strength of the other members, right? However, a call and response has been woven into many aspects of American life. So you can even see the same kind of thing and for the same kind of reasons uh, uh, in other aspects of uh, life. I don't have to play these. Um, uh, James Brown would come into play here, um, but you can see this in military cases. So uh, uh, we see call and response in military cases as it, had, as it was observed beginning in the 1940s uh, that call and response style cadences build morale uh, keep a, march, a marching rhythm and assist with cardiovascular development. That, that's the military's reasons for uh, 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 making cadences based on call and response. Uh, so here, uh, uh, many of the same themes that make it useful for those in uh, uh, the video from a couple of slides ago are highlighted as reasons for it by the military. Uh, we see this in children's songs and games, uh, if you're happy and you know it. Uh, 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 furthermore, we don't have to look at this, but we see these in, in, in sort of uh, uh, like camp games and things like that, things that you uh, would play if you go to uh, camp, uh, <clears throat> and much for the same reason, right? <clears throat> and we even see it used as a pedagogical tool. All right, so you have uh, Angela Watson here who has a kind of call and response pedagogy. All right, what she has here is time or call and response is a time tested technique for getting attention, not just in the classroom, but in the military and churches at sporting events and in traditional cultures in various parts of the world. All right, um, so uh, we see it with children's songs and games and is used as a pedagogical tool uh, as it is thought to help build memory and assist in focus. Uh, these are just some of the ways, I'll stop here, but these are just some of the ways uh, that you see things like call and response. Uh, I didn't get into uh, 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 the ring shout as much with uh, uh, dance, uh, but if that comes up in either uh, 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 here amongst us or on Zoom, I'd be happy to talk about it. All right, so uh, let me stop here. Um, and turn things over to uh, Dr. Susie. <laughs> we got it? All right, can everybody hear me? Okay, there's some chat. I don't know if we should see that. Should we take a look at that? Okay, okay. Hello, says Noel. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, forgive us all for trying to 
get this right in terms of all of the technology. It's part one of the one of the things that we have to do in the age of COVID, figure out all of this. So I should say at the outset that there is no one black aesthetics. Um, there's no one way to talk about black experience. And I am certainly the last person who should propose a way to talk about either of those things. But in the attempt to understand the dimensions of aesthetic experience and what they mean to the varieties of being human, I want to offer an appreciation of what scholars have identified as characteristic of the black aesthetic experience by way of differentiating from Eurocentric white aesthetic theory. Any white aesthetic theory by way has been historically described through the lens of European art forms under the unfortunate universalism that tends to steamroll the articulation of aesthetics under a few philosophers such as Hume, and Kant, who are supposed to set the standards and the stage for any discipline that calls itself aesthetics. Paul Taylor does construct a philosophy of Black aesthetics and outlines the interest to avoid a monolithic representation while describing the, quote, essentially philosophic preoccupations that routinely animate and surround the culture and work of Black peoples. So again, there is no African culture Part of the problem with studying what the Black or African American experience is that the enslaved peoples were so diverse to begin with. Thrown together in the cargo holds of ships in a melange of languages and religions. Lennox Hubron writes, in North America, for instance, one can find in the Gula Islands and in Virginia, the predominance of Fante Ashanti cultures in New Orleans, the Damian and the Bantu culture in Central America, the Yoruba culture in Haiti and Northern Brazil, Fon culture. So they became communities by the process of cultural change. And the enslaved shared the experience of enslavement. All else had to be created by them, observed Sidney Mintz and Richard Price. So to start off, I wanted to give us um, Barclay Hendricks's Lottie Mama. So what you see here is um, it looks like Angela Davis, but this is actually his cousin. And I love this piece. I saw it at the Broad a few years ago, and it's really um, beautiful in person. I don't know if you can see that gold leaf, but what does that, what does the use of the gold leaf, the use of the curved, um, you know, uh, frame, what does all of that tell you? What do you see here going on in this, in this piece? Any thoughts of what he's trying to communicate? I definitely see something that's uh, holy. Uh, yes. Holy, like a halo type of thing. Yes, her, like her, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he even says that using the gold leaf kicked his butt because it's so hard to use. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, an arduous process. This is actually his cousin. He, um, he, he gives us this beautiful, um, this beautiful young woman who is also just an ordinary person. So not a saint, not a holy figure or anything, but she is in the guise of all of that, all of the holiness. Um, not so holy is this. Um, so this is John Gabriel Stedman. And what he gives us is an interesting window into the beginning of the creation of the, the Black aesthetic experience as a communal one. So he writes, all, of, all the slaves are led upon, I'm going to have to move this so I can. All the slaves are led upon deck their hair shaved in different figures of stars, half moons, which they generally do one to the other, having no razors by the help of a broken bottle and without soap. So the interesting thing here is that they still wanted to groom themselves in some way. They, in other words, wanted to create an aesthetic, collective aesthetic experience with their bodies. And the um, he, he, 
Sedman is one of these really difficult figures who thinks of himself as an abolitionist, but obviously um, that was not the case. But he does give us this very interesting window into that beginning of that formation. And so this, um, this actually comes from the, um, the study by Sidney Mintz and Richard Price in the birth of African-American culture. And they say, it is hard to imagine a more impressive example of irrepressible cultural vitality than this image of slaves decorating one another's hair in the midst of one of the most dehumanizing experiences in all of history. And so to me, that's just a, a symbol of how the, um, that, that black ex experience that even in the midst of such a horrific situation that, that, um, that they wanted to, to, to make themselves look as beautiful as they possibly could, even if it meant using a broken bottle. This is, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forget his first name. <laughs> I have to find it here because I can't, it's, it's, okay, here we are. We just, I'll just move this again. I'm sorry. Ah, <laughs> bigger. So this is Jeff Donaldson, um, Wives of Sango. So um, he, he was one of the, um, he was one, let's see, I'm sorry. I, I'm um, miss, missing up my stuff here. Okay, here we are. He, he co-founded the group Africoba. Um, African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists in Chicago, 1968, the year Martin Luther King Jr. was married, was murdered. Uh, race riots are erupting across America. The Vietnam War is raging. Um, it was originally called COBRA, the Coalition of Black Revolutionary Artists. The addition of the prefix AFRI to this group signified an important aesthetic shift. The recognition that living in America meant that Blacks were members of a diasporic community. In this painting, Wives of Sango, Donaldson depicts the Yoruba god of lightning's three wives in modern dress. So we have Orshan, Oba, and Oya. The middle is facing frontally, while the ones on either side turn toward the painting's edges. They are wearing bandoliers with rifles slung over their shoulders. We have sections of gold and silver foil that are affixed that it might be a little difficult to see in much the same way as Barclay Hendricks did um, to the dresses of the women, meticulously patterning, pat, pat, patterning their clothes and skin without overwhelming their features or their body in a gorgeous example of, um, of that black revolutionary aesthetic. So to do Black aesthetics is to use art, criticism, or analysis to explore the role that expressive objects and practices play in creating and maintaining Black life worlds. From the 1960s, when some of the people formerly known as Negroes decided that self-identifying as Black would help turn the page on the historic failures and ideological limitations of the past. So that is Paul Taylor from his uh, study of Black aesthetics. So in order to kind of look at what um, uh, the, the similarities that we were taught, that we were looking at with Dr. Barnes, I wanted us to see a little clip from a movie if, uh, maybe I should just skip it, but because um, his own clips were so good. Um, but but it, it, this isn't the same, um, dance that he was showing, but what it shows is that the dance becomes a way of life. So it isn't just something that you do in spare time. The dance becomes a way of life in every aspect. Um, James Cone writes, Black music is not artistic creation for its own sake. Rather, it tells us about the thinking and feeling of an African people and the kinds of mental adjustments they had to make in order to survive in an alien land. The work songs were a means of heightening energy, converting labor into dances and games. We saw that in Dr. Barnes' talk. Providing emotional excitement in an otherwise unbearable situation. The emphasis was on free, continuous, creative energy as produced in song. Um, 
So I just thought that that was a great example of what it means to see how dance becomes not just, not just something fun, but something that actually expresses her, you know, her, her frustration, her anger, her, um, her, you know, just desperation to make um, things right for these men. Okay. So back to, am I screen, I'm not screen sharing for everybody. So this goes back into <laughs> this back here, right? Okay, I think I can do that. Okay. And are we back to the, to the, oh, no, no, no. Okay, okay, great, great, great. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to contrast this experience um, is the white theories that unfortunately um, have been created. Um, and have, have sort of, you know, what I want, want to show is that hopefully heading into um, a more postmodern, we can see the, the, the way that um, the modern kind of needs to fall away. So I'll start off with bell hooks kind of giving us a sense of what aesthetics is. She says, it's more than a philosophy or a theory of art and beauty. It is a way of inhabiting space a particular location, a way of looking and becoming. So, unquote. So in white Eurocentric academics, aesthetics is a philosophy or a theory of art and beauty. It's not a way of life. It's not a way of inhabiting space. It should be remarked that the ideas of race and of the aesthetic came about at the same historical time, along with modern ideas of humanity and civilization. This enlightenment drive to categorize and label aesthetics as an academic discipline emerged out of the enlightenment at a time when notions of quote civilization were conflated with quote reason and what was deemed good, true or beautiful. So Alexander Baumgarten first labels this study of making judgments in artistic discourse and he borrows the Greek word for sensation or perception, which is esthesis. Hume and Kant further attenuate the interest to categorize judgments of taste and beauty, Kant noting the complex interplay of, of, uh, of our mental faculties of perception, imagination, and intellect or judgment. He wished to investigate the seemingly widespread human agreement that roses are beautiful and cockroaches are ugly. On one hand, there is the subjective that beauty or ugliness is a matter of personal taste or preference. On the other, there is the Enlightenment project which set forth the modern Western assumption that all human beings must respond in the same way to at least some sights and sounds. Kant, in keeping with the Enlightenment interest to boil complexity and multifaceted truths into a hegemonic syrup of general principles, argued that epistemologically, when one observes that a rose is beautiful, one expects universal agreement. Judgments about what is beautiful are then subjective and universal at the same time. Cornell West reminds us though, that the authority of science undergirded by modern philosophical discourse promotes and encourages activities of observing, comparing, measuring, and ordering the physical characteristics of human bodies. Forms of rationality and science prohibited the legitimacy of black equality and beauty, culture and intellectual capacity. To think about black and white equally was deemed irrational, barbaric or mad. So this is where white supremacy gathers its forces in the expectation that there is no contextual or historical location to aesthetic experience. Just that I think something is beautiful, therefore everyone must. And that the I that Kant always refers to is the white male. Kant's solipsism became part of the enlightenment paradigm that shapes the modern world. Ideas about the structure, character and capacities of different human types came to shape human affairs on a scale never seen before. With white experience and white perception, the standard bearer of what was understood and what is understood as human, and then white male perception, and then white male ownership perception. 
The massive project of social engineering, imperialism, colonialism, force and voluntary migrations, the extermination of entire peoples and cultures, the making and unmaking of entire civilizations anchored by the hegemonic conflation of European cultural practices with the idea of what it means to be human. Paul Taylor argues that modernity refers to a constellation of social conditions orbiting the practices of white supremacy. If we venture toward a postmodern shaping of aesthetic understanding, we recognize that there can never be one critical paradigm for the evaluation of an artistic work. Black aesthetics promotes a way of seeing that aesthetic prototypes vary across cultures and vary across the varieties of human experience. A radical aesthetic knowledge refers to constantly changing locations and concerns. Sometimes taste is acquired, learned through community experience and practice. Um, Bell Hooks often refers to her Baba, her grandmother, who did not think in conventional academic theoretical language, but provided Bell Hooks a contemplative aesthetic vision, vision quote, the shadows in Baba's house, the way the moon entered an upstairs window and created new ways for me to see dark and light helped me to see blackness in a new way. For Bell Hooks, the aesthetic response is a way of looking and becoming. She writes that growing up poor meant a disdain for her own surroundings, that capitalism and consumer expectations affected her capacity to see. She also notes that art in black communities intrinsically serves a political function. Whatever African-Americans created, this is a quote, from her, whatever African-Americans created in music, dance, poetry, painting was regarded as a testimony bearing witness, challenging racist thinking, which suggest, suggested that black folks are not fully human, were uncivilized, and that the measure of this was our collective failure to create great art, unquote. She notes that white supremacist assumption that whiteness is the standard bearer for what constitutes civilization engages the finer sensibilities of which Hume and Kant believe cultivate taste. Responding to this white supremacist notion, enslaved Africans practiced a lived aesthetic, a lived sensuality that was so essential to survival that it shaped a community's resistance. If we contrast this with the Kantian notion of art for art's sake, Kant qualified art for art's sake as a mode of approaching art in the critique of judgment, declaring content, subject matter, and any other external demands obsolete, Kant argued that the purpose of art is to be purposeless. So we can go back to the Kant slide real quick. So the purpose of art for Kant is that you are detached from, its, from the object as something that is something you live out or something that you use in some way. Um, he, he said that art should not have to justify any reason of existing and being valued other than the fact that it is art. So, okay, there's the added argument that one must be detached as well as being disinterested in the artist having a purpose, even if the purpose is just pleasure. So if, for example, if one is sexually aroused by the painting, The Birth of Venus, as we presume was one of its reasons that it was first hung in a Medici bedroom, one cannot appreciate it as art, according to Kant. Rather, Kant says the beautiful object's form satisfies our imagination and intellect. Evaluating Kantian philosophy, I wonder if he ever got laid. When we consider the practice of the displaced African slaves, Bell Hooks writes, we see that they brought to this country an aesthetic based on the belief that beauty, especially that created in a collective context, must be integrated into every aspect of life enhancing the survival and development of a community, making connections with the past. This historical aesthetic legacy has proved so powerful that consumer capitalism has not been able to completely destroy artistic production in underclass com black communities, she writes. Poor black parents sought artistic cultural production as crucial to the struggle against racism, but they were also cognizant of the link between creating art and pleasure. Art was necessary to bring delight, pleasure, and beauty into lives that were hard. She argues that there was little distinction between the sacred and secular and the lived aesthetic experience from the talent show to the church to the cookout, the performance of art and the life of the community are interdependent. 
So while there is an attempt by African-American intellectual elites to raise these forms to the enlightenment and white categories of quote, high art, there is also the work of painters, writers, and musicians that intersects the evocation of black nationhood, homeland, and diaspora with the black revolution in what Larry Neal describes as the black arts movement. After the assassination of Malcolm X in 1965, Leroy Jones, later known as Amari Baraka, moved to Harlem to establish the Black Arts Repertory Theater, or BARTS, which led to the Black Arts Movement. The problem with this movement, Bell Hooks points out, is that it was essentialist, characterized by an us versus them dichotomy, which dismissed work by Black artists, which did not emerge from the Black Power Movement. She writes, rather than serving as a catalyst promoting diverse artistic expression, the Black arts movement began to dismiss all forms of cultural production by African Americans that did not conform to the movement's criteria, which did not allow for recognition of multiple Black experience or the complexity of Black life, unquote. She points out that, quote, when Black folks start thinking solely of us and them, they internalize the value system of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, diminishing the capacity for the building of community. Hooks criticizes the Black arts movement for the same forms of exclusivism as white supremacist notions that whiteness is the yardstick of civilization. Often though, revolutions behave in these narrow waves to locate identity for the sake of strength of message. Hooks also recognizes that this radical questioning of the place and meaning of aesthetics for Black artistic production, the movement's insistence that all art is political, that an ethical dimension should serve cultural production helped Black thinkers articulate strategies of decolonization. Bell Hooks writes, quote, an African-American discourse on aesthetics need not begin with white Western traditions and it need not be prescriptive. Cultural decolonization does not happen solely by repudiating all that appears to maintain connection with the colonizing culture, unquote. Black aesthetics recognizes that art is not purposeless the way Kant thought, but it affects the totality, that Black artists, Black art forms are not just for Black audiences and don't just affect, affect Black communities, but are the catalyst for a liberatory politic that critically interrogates repressive structures for the benefit of a truly authentic humanity. She writes, much of what threatens our collective well being is the product of dominating structures. Racism is a white issue as much as it is a black one. I wanted you to see, too, Faith Ringgold. Um, she is um, known for all sorts of media. She does painting, sculpture, quilts. This is from the series Coming to Jones Road. And that phrase coming to Jones Road alludes to her difficult move in 92 from Harlem to Inglewood, New Jersey, where she said the neighbors saw my presence on Jones Road as a threat to the quality of their lives. So the text all around the border says Aunt Emmy could be in two places at the same time, out back cutting wood for the fire and tending to them kids stirring up trouble in the field and Uncle Tate could vanish in a flash and show up in the same way. Well, one day they just up and walk to freedom and nobody see him go. Not nobody, nobody but Jesus. And so, and, and also in this series is a lithograph and you can see that there's some allusion to the Underground Railroad and getting to safety. So here the text reads, one day they just, they too just up and walk to freedom and nobody see them go. Then Aunt Emmy voice rumbling through the field say, time to walk to freedom. Look for a white farmhouse with a star quilt on the roof. And you can see the star. God be your guide as you, as God be your guide, you as good as free. Aunt Emmy could be in two places at the same time and Uncle Tate could, flan could vanish in a flash and turn up in the same way. And so just to close with the wonderful Bell Hooks, one of my favorite quotes from her. <clears throat> I also um, wanted to point out her, um, her uh, citing of the Buddhist Joanna Macy that when you open yourself to the pain of the world, you move, you act but that can burn you out. So you need the other, which is why the call and response 
mechanism is so wonderful. You need that, that dynamic you know, in, in all aspects of life. You need insight into the radical interdependence of all phenomena. Love provides that aesthetic vision. Compassion makes it real. She writes, the moment we choose to love, we begin to move against domination, against oppression. The moment we choose to love, to, we begin to move toward freedom, to act in ways that liberate ourselves and others. That action is the testimony of love in the practice of freedom, which is also what it means to think aesthetically. So thank you all.